Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the session on the role of collaborative innovation in the implementation of NUA and CDG in uh, 11 in times of COVID. Uh, we have uh, three distinguished uh, colleagues here uh, presenting their work. Uh, I will introduce uh, the session. My name is Tuna Tashankov from University of Amsterdam. I'm an urban planner and I'm professor of urban governance and planning at University of Amsterdam. Uh, and our uh, speakers are, uh, I will uh, introduce in the order of uh, appearance in the presentations. Um, Serin uh, Gambazu, uh, she is assistant professor uh, of uh, urban and landscape design and uh, at Ion Minchu University of Architecture and Urban Planning. And then we have uh, Gözde Sharlak uh, Kramer, research and teaching associate at Urban Design Master Program of Haven City University of Hamburg. And then last but not least, uh, Dr. Evren Uzer, Assistant Professor of Urban Planning at Parsons School of Design, the New School, New York. Um, so uh, I welcome everyone and um, I would like to give the floor to Gözde immediately. And um, I'm sorry, Serin immediately. And um, uh, we are going to have uh, 15 minutes of presentations, and then we will have uh, some questions and discussion time afterwards. Okay, Serin, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I will share my screen first. I hope you can all see it. So um, I'm going to start with a um, cliche phrase, of course, with the fact that COVID-19 has marked 2020 year and brought on our planning agenda and contributed to in-depth changes in our lifestyle. We are on Zoom now, after all. I think all of us here, three of us, wanted to be there in person. However, if we look back along the history, cities have been always shaped by this kind of health crisis. Therefore, I'm proposing for today's presentation a learning process from the actions taken during the pandemic for urban future in uh, planning with the case study of Romania, Southeastern Europe. But if we have to contextualize this, what we are facing now or maybe failing, uh, it must be seen as a result of a series of events related to climate issues, to deep inequalities and challenges brought by rapid urbanization. Looking at the SDGs, because we are talking today about them and the goals set, uh, looking at the report from 2020, it shows us that even before COVID-19, we were not there on meeting the goals by 2030, because change was not happening at the speed or scale required. For some places, it is, and it will always be too late, if we don't design short-term responses and engage in accelerated actions, which sometimes as urban planners, we tend to miss in uh, long distance planning strategies. But it is particularly during times of crisis that we mobilize to take action. And I think we should learn from this. Considering that 90% uh, of cases um, of COVID-19 live in urban areas, we should focus on the goal 11. And I think it makes this achievement more and more challenging. However, scholars have uh, put questions forward and maybe we are gonna debate uh, on this, if we should change amend or even um, complete the new urban agenda SDGs in the light of COVID-19. I think we should not focus on retyping strategies, but rather integrating everything that we have at hand, the Paris Agreement or new green deals or everything that is and um, make planners integrate solutions and engage in collaborative action. So looking at the COVID-19 crisis, let's see what are the opportunities. In Romania, many responses to COVID-19 crisis have demonstrated collaborative working and social innovation change, which is 
a very important step escaping the top-down approach legacy from a communist background. And I would like to draw attention to these examples at the grassroots level, some supported by public authorities, but some just on their own support and how they managed to break and uh, to, to promote inclusive planning. I think cities will need to draw on their exceptional creativity now to do more with less. So we should look for hope, ideas, prototypes, best practices, as agile responses and immediate solutions to this crisis, simple hands-on practice. Innovative, maybe in terms of solution-oriented. Some facts regarding the SDGs and the Romanian example is that the government established a department for sustainable development uh, functioning as part of prime minister's office. So we see again, a very top down approach still. However, we are uh, probably almost targeting the, the goal set for 2020 on the SDG goal seven, affordable and clean energy. But on the reverse, I cannot say the same for achieving goals uh, in other areas, urgent action needs to be done in the SDG one for end poverty and SDG six clean water and sanitation. Because Romania has one of the highest rates of poverty in Europe, almost 27% or so. So even if we are thinking of energy and the smart solutions, we still have to acknowledge that there are some urban poor to be taken care of. And although we have um, a percentage of uh, 96 uh, ownership, home ownership rate, the highest in the world actually, uh, we are dealing with severe housing deprivation problems, which is uh, almost four times bigger than the average in Europe. And this makes homelessness an urgent problem to be tackled, especially in the pandemic times. But unfortunately, there is no national homelessness data collection strategy. So we are very at the beginning with this. On the other hand, 2020 marked a huge growth in the construction sector regarding residential, uh, residential contract, uh, construction with uh, 16%. And as response to this alarming growth, a lot of collective effort has um, been put into sustainable housing solutions and education on these concepts. And there's an NGO that uh, with the support of the government ministries and other private entities and academia put forward a sustainable city concept uh, kind of uh, prototype. So after having this background information, I would like to introduce you now into the bottom up examples that I mentioned at the beginning First one out of series of five, Viziere.ro started as an idea in a 3D printing studio of some architects and in just 30 days became a national movement. So what are the takeaways here? I think we should acknowledge the role of and importance of informal systems that I think everybody saw all around the world and include them in our future planning policies. This particular action, it could be a contribution to SDG 17 related to effective partnerships and uh, civil society partnerships, and also maybe SDG 9 for the 3D innovative perspective. A second example that I extracted is uh, an example of a local NGO that built a modular hospital in six weeks in the courtyard of a hospital in uh, Bucharest, the capital city through volunteer work and the diverse types of donations. Of course, the goals that, that, that it contributes to are very clear here, but the future planning takeaways that I want to extract from this lesson is uh, maybe involvement of NGO in public service planning, redefining tax policy and tax donations, which helped a lot in this kind uh, of action. Without them, uh, I don't think this, uh, action could have been possible. And maybe for the future design of our cities, leaving open space reserves for public services, if we will have to think of the importance of urban commons. The third example uh, is uh, on an NGO 
uh, it's called Food Collection and Distribution Bank. It's present in many cities around uh, Romania. And it had the, uh, and it did a great work in food distribution during the pandemics. But the lesson here is how it inspired the district municipality to do the same and engage in uh, building a food bank, a social kitchen, and a community center for uh, disadvantaged groups. So maybe these are policies to be taken into account in future planning. The following last two examples that I extracted, they refer much more to the digitalization part and to the participation part of planning. Uh, these examples uh, relate especially to the communication technology that application promoted by SDG 9, but they also relate to the goal 17 as well with the effective public, private and civil society partnership. Code for Romania is an NGO that develops IT solutions and it has a partnership with the government and ministries for about three years in uh, providing free digital products in open source formats on themes as health now on the light of COVID-19 pandemic with in information to the citizens, education, the environment and public participation. What happened especially uh, in this crisis is that it created a department, Civic Tech 911, that offers IT solutions to any NGO that wants to develop an app. So basically any NGO can propose an action and they help you achieve it. And another innovative platform is of Cluj. It's another city, big city of Romania. And it's a project in partnership with Cluj municipality and academia. And it's actually uh, documenting the initiatives taken by NGOs and private uh, entities in order to extract lessons, but also to give them a meeting point and to know uh, one from another. Takeaways here of both maybe would be the importance of digitalization, the public participation tools and cross-sectoral co uh, collaborations. Lastly, uh, an example that we've seen all around the world probably and uh, promoted by planners for long are this kind of open streets or pedestrianizing the streets. Open streets is a manifesto for the future of the capital city here. And it is an important step for us for a quality of urban life. The project started uh, in 2021, so it's very recent and um, it proposed to enhance public space, increase the safety for cyclists uh, and other uh, groups, and encourage recreational activities in the public space. Uh, with this, reducing car access also helped in uh, uh, reduced pollution and also encouraged local economy, which was affected by the pandemic times. The street that I'm showing here and why I selected this example, and it's very important, at least in Romanian context, is that the street that I'm showing has been proposed to be pedestrianized for many times in the last 10 years. But this is the first time where all stakeholders agreed, be rather private entities that have uh, shops or anything there, or the car owners, the citizens. And I think it is something in particular that in pandemic crisis, that the pandemic crisis brought light and drew everyone's attention to the well-being of the locals, which I think this was lost. And um, the globalization, the fast pace of globalization with cities promoting their most glamorous spaces, attracting investments and tourists. So as conclusions, I want to put forward that moment of crisis and force pre-existing problems. It was already too late for some parts of the world. We need integrated solutions and we need integrated and sustainable solutions and collaborative focus uh, and also make room for bottom-up initiatives. But they cannot survive, at least here in our context, without also the top-down approach and they should meet uh, in between. We should embrace and make use of the technology they mentioned in our cities and be conscious, especially as planners, because we are sometimes reluctant in incorporating it into our plans. We live in a new spatial consciousness. I think there is not yet a paradigm shift 
but we caught a momentum in mobilizing critical political will in tackling urgent urbanization problems. And there is much more of a broader awareness and demand from the citizens. So looking at the COVID-19 crisis and what should be opportunities, I think the solutions lie in the way we can learn from these immediate actions and responses. Rather than being an existential threat, this crisis may lead to more inclusive urbanism in some parts of the world. And I would like to end my presentation with a theoretical framework that suits uh, best the times we are living in. A, uh, and that's the right to the city notion. A group of the uh, good proof of the international recognition of it being the vision uh, of cities for all of the new urban agenda. And I think David Harvey describes it beautifully. Uh, the right to the city that is far more than individual liberty to access to urban resources, but rather exercise of a collective power to reshape processes of urbanization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sirin, for this uh, refreshing presentation and uh, quite hopeful as well. Um, before moving to the next uh, speaker, I just put a little note on the chat box asking whether anybody has uh, questions um, so that I can pass them. But if not, um, I'm going to move uh, immediately to uh, Gözde. Um, hello, I hope uh, you can hear me well. Yeah, good. Perfect. Um, yeah, my name is Gözde Şayla Kremer and uh, my talk today is titled Enhancing um, Modes of Collaboration in Berlin, Thinking the New Urban Agenda Through the Lens of Housing in the Midst of the Pandemic. Uh, and in the following 15 minutes, my aim is to think uh, with the concept of innovation in the context of housing in Berlin, um, through a specific urban development project uh, taking place um, at the House um, of Statistics. Um, so as we heard from Sarin's presentation, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with the New Urban Agenda uh, as an action-oriented document, a framework um, that contributes to the localization of the Sustainable Urban Development Goals, uh, promoting social, economic, environmental and spatial sustainability at its core dimensions. Um, uh, of action and to implement those core actions some strategies and techniques are introduced in different governance uh, levels and, and one of those intervention mechanisms is stated as um, housing and slum upgrading and, and as uh, the new urban agenda promotes housing policies that support the progressive realization of the right um, um, to uh, an adequate housing um, for all. Um, and you can see in the screen box, um, um, there are also particular um, uh, principles that they inherit, like um, eliminating discrimination and considering the needs of the um, unhoused persons um, in vulnerable situations, and also enabling the participation and engagement of the communities and relevant stakeholders. But how these stated principles are mobilized on the ground and do they remain as wishful intentions circumcised by uh, capitalist private economic interests and um, what do the local governments do to produce progressive housing policies especially in berlin and how some actors groups or communities engage in socially creative initiatives aimed at better addressing the essential problems um, um, around housing um, in berlin in this presentation i'll have a look at um, certain um, components of those questions um, so just to bring you um, to, the, to the context of it, um, in the last years, access to affordable and adequate housing mobilized quite a diverse movement of tenants, housing communities, initiatives, activists in, in Berlin, um, and hardly in any other major um, city in Germany, the topic was discussed in such consistency and engagement. And that has uh, presented, of course, the potential to also transform current housing policies radically. Um, but what are the dynamics of such deepening housing crisis in Berlin and how it evolved um, during the pandemic? Um, so as you might guess, this is a very complex and interconnected matter, uh, which is closely tied with recent developments in 
and beyond Berlin. And I will just try to offer very simplified components of the steepening crisis here. Um, so in Berlin, there are around uh, 1.8 million housing units and 83% um, of them are rented, which simply points to the fact that Berlin is a tenant city. And traditionally, housing was primarily state subsidized, uh, both in the West and East. But following the re reunification, the publicly owned housing stock was uh, bought was largely sold to overcome um, the fiscal crisis. And around 220,000 housing units uh, belong to the city were privatized during that time. Um, and so 67% uh, of them was sold to private investors and hedge funds. And in the last decade alone, the average rent in Berlin increased by 37%. That um, makes 30% uh, um, of monthly living costs and uh, uh, monthly living income um, of uh, households. So the purchasing prices for apartments um, has also tripled in that time. Um, and um, during COVID-19, uh, instable labor market worsened the situation um, in terms of uh, creating a crisis of affordability. And today, companies such as uh, Deutsche Wohnen hold around 250,000 housing units and that makes them important actors for housing speculation in Berlin. Um, and although there are certain tenant protection laws in place, they are not alone able to limit the speculation. And long-standing tenants are uh, more and more endangered in certain neighborhoods um, that makes displacement not only a side effect, but a precondition for the realization of economic maximum profits. And the citizens um, will continue facing lack of alternatives to displacement if uh, this trend continues. But while affordability and privatization of housing markets form a prominent axis of debates on the emerging housing crisis in the city, issues such as culturally inclusive, multi-generational, social and environmentally just housing politics remains as a mutually concerning and interconnected topic. So as I was uh, preparing uh, this talk uh, last Sunday, um, there has been a refreshing and hopeful turn for the residents of Berlin. And a referendum was initiated to expropriate uh, the housing stock owned by corp corporate landlords uh, based on Article 15 and transferring um, the assets to a public body managed by the tenants. Um, on Sunday, more than 1 million people uh, or Berlin voters um, endorsed this proposal. And by this vote, uh, the voters initiated that further feasibility research to be uh, done, um, especially to see financial costs and manageability of such proposal. Nonetheless, this is quite a success, uh, success for the civil society to assemble such a movement and gather such a response coming from over hundreds of um, tenant organizations, labor unions, political parties, and other grassroots movements. So, um, Today's panel intrigued me to examine closely these political developments in housing uh, in Berlin and bring those into conversation uh, with the concept of innovation. I have my reservations about the con uh, contemporary use of the term as it's simultaneously used with technical innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, economic growth, outweighing its social and cultural dimensions and capacity. I would rather focus on its um, uh, after feminist scholars, I would rather focus on its revolutionary and transformative capacity, arguing it as a social process shaped through social technical relations and built dance, creative and inclusive relationships. Um, so until here, I try to sensitize you towards the historical contingencies and current political debates and citizen responses organized around the housing crisis in Berlin. And what follows, I will focus on the urban transformation project, and, and I will try to trace how urban actors engage in creative initiatives and innovate collaboration that trigger social change. Um, this project is anchored in the former House of Statistics and House der Statistik in German. The building um, uh, was used um, as the National Statistical Office of East Germany and was erected in the 1960s. Um, and it was used for the same purpose until the reunification. And right after 1990, it was um, um, it continued to be used as a statistical office, but uh, this time for the Federal uh, Republic of Germany, 
and hosting partially the gruesome archive of Ministry of the State Security known also as Stasi. Um, and in uh, 2008, the state offices left the building, uh, leaving behind this 40,000 uh, square meters um, uh, vacant uh, for almost a decade. Um, so the building complex is um, in close proximity um, with Berlin's uh, one of the most symbolic squares, Alexanderplatz, and, and um, TV towers. Um, and it was one of the, um, uh, it is in close proximity with this um, other administrative buildings of East German, um, East German uh, Republic. So Alexander Plus was imagined as a stage for architecture and urban design that would establish Berlin as a modern um, socialist world capital. Um, and after, after a decade of vacancy, the Senate uh, planned to um, sell the building and an urban development project was initially proposed to demolish the housing complex. Um, following that, in 2015, a group of artists developed a fictitious campaign that shifted the course of the planned development. They hung a banner um, which closely reassembled uh, or resembled uh, the style of municipal information panels spotted often in the city, saying, here arises for Berlin, room for art, culture and social space. The campaign was fictitious, um, but it hinted at underlying urgencies um, of affordable spaces for arts and culture and housing in the inner city. So the artist group Alliance of Threatened Berlin Studio Houses uh, behind the campaign um, state, I quote, the current politics of refugees, economic city development and justice demand new ways to deal with crises and structural problems. The house, their statistic, in the center of Berlin can become an example to show that with creativity, political will and cooperation change is possible." Unquote. So um, following that, um, the initiative of House, House of uh, Statistics was formed as an alliance of various Berlin actors, um, including federal government institutes, uh, local government um, um, uh, institutes, and civil society actors, and state-owned um, social housing campaign, uh, uh, companies um, to form um, a, a coexistence collaboration uh, platform, a legal body basically, uh, called COOP5, um, to manage the developments happening in uh, House uh, of Statistics. And, and these partners uh, closely work together uh, to kind of um, manage the uh, urban development process in the um, yeah, uh, following years. And their aim um, is, um, as stated, as uh, working towards a common good with a mutual responsibility and, and obligation to realize this common good um, with broad involvement of urban society um, and um, including variety of uses from residential, administrative to social and cultural spheres and use of the site um, and its exceptional location and, and developing a, a sustainable standard for it. Um, so here is kind of the actor network um, diagram of, of current development and COOP5 um, and consisted of these local and um, um, federal government um, Kind of institutes and also civil uh, society organizations um, is a central actor um, for development, but there are also current um, pioneer users um, that brings um, urban society to the site and, and kind of um, lays the ground for future use, so to speak. So those pioneer users um, were introduced um, um, by an open call um, to civil society, to urban society in Berlin, um, and anyone uh, fi with filling this form, basically, that you can see here, um, could propose their uh, project depending on different um, timelines. Um, so the curators of, uh, that are included in COOP uh, 15 um, judged those proposals by um, their capacity of providing common good orientation, diversity, cooperation, experimentation, responsibility, um, orientation. Um, and in common day, we can um, uh, categorize those um, pioneer users um, 
around food and environment. Um, for instance, um, cooking together solidarity-based agriculture uh, practices and food sharing networks, cooking workshops are um, taking place on the first uh, common floor of the, of the building. Um, sustainable material management is another category focusing on handling of various uh, materials, textiles, building materials, but also a repair shop and has been installed here um, also closely uh, dealing with the building's repair itself. Um, numerous dance, music and um, neighborhood events were um, um, also taking place in the building and a choir was found that um, neighborhood people was also joining. Um, and space, there was also space to dive uh, to diverse and marginalized groups uh, from the neighborhood as well as uh, from the city. And depending on the context, uh, this could uh, be a shelter, a low threshold space for realization of one's own projects or community spaces. Sorry, and um, lastly, um, um, the building itself and the project itself served as an important on-site on -site learning laboratory um, by engaging it with experimental and collaborative learning formats related to urban practice and urban development. So there's, there were certain summer schools um, um, taking place in the building and I myself were, was also part of um, some of them. Yeah, and finally, I wanted to um, kind of introduce those two um, um, categories of, of learnings um, from this process. Um, so first, first part is kind of on the conceptual um, and reflection moments um, of thinking um, through housing with innovation. Uh, what could this um, example uh, provide uh, for conceptualizations of, of innovation, especially in the context of, of new urban agenda? And um, inventing, um, as it seem, seems as a collaborative, uh, a creative um, um, endeavor, but it also, um, um, but it also is very uncertain, burdensome from time to time. So it could also uh, generate um, um, certain negative emotions, affect um, around it. Um, but nevertheless, it's uh, it's um, a process that agencies shared not only um, on the innovator and the entrepreneur or the scientist, but with the community that's involved in it. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a process and a practice. Um, and returning to the roots of the term, it's a revolutionary act for the common good. It's a creative, um, generative, transformative uh, process. And this project is also kind of um, providing um, 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 an important um, space for self-organization and um, citizen participation, innovative forms of integration. And um, for cities like Berlin, um, um, that has uh, more than 20% um, uh, kind of migrants uh, in their demographic uh, profile. Um, and as a, a replicable legal model, um, this governing collectively, this um, um, body of COOP uh, also provides um, a kind of a transformative a legal body for further um, um, housing projects to take place. And um, yeah, building and sustaining collaboration and collective learning um, is also an important aspect. Um, there, there is a, a, a big need for such spaces to test, experiment, and imagine the future of, uh, of cities uh, differently, and also um, taking the initiative to reflect and reclaim the um, contradictory uh, past of certain um, sites um, in cities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gözde. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat box, so I would like to move to Evran's presentation. Thank you very much. Um, Gözde, can you unshare? It works. 
the screening. Perfect. Um, thank you, Professor Tashankök, for your introduction, and to my colleagues uh, Serin and Gözde for very inspiring um, presentations, um, hearing the experiences and elaborations um, of the pandemic experience and response, um, and relating it to um, how we have been looking into the new urban agenda. Um, pandemic clearly uh, sent signs that uh, how we should approach the spatial practices for the next crisis, which are uh, for certain going to come. Um, and also pointed out in which ways we can develop new methods and, and practices um, to, to respond. Uh, for this panel, I, I will share the impact of COVID-19 pandemic um, and community and local responses to the pandemic uh, at one of the earlier epicenters of COVID-19 crisis, uh, New York City. Uh, reflecting on our future practices that looks into community-driven efforts uh, that can lead towards safe, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable cities. And I would also like to problematize our approach to metrics and suggest whether we can develop a more nuanced way of understanding, collecting, and analyzing data that drives these uh, metrics. And I think in, in the earlier two presentations as well that we've been hearing on um, um, looking into innovation from a community-driven uh, bottom-up uh, efforts and, um, and work. Um, okay. So the COVID-19 pandemic was a crisis we haven't prepared for, even though we have, we have a lot of different um, uh, preparations. So in January 9, uh, 2020, New York City officials received the alert that uh, uh, from CDC Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention that the novel coronavirus was rapidly spreading in China. In the months that followed, New York City became an early epicenter of the pandemic. And as of today, that has claimed lives of more than 54,000 New Yorkers and inflicted an unprecedented harm to the city's residents, businesses, and finances. The city never um, completed an um, operational plan for responding, so we were not um, really ready um, prior to it. There had been a strategic plan uh, that outlined, but um, it lacked an operational um, guideline on how to how to respond. And in a city as large as New York, um, that it created the um, almost unexpected um, chaos. Um, the city also struggled to identify and locate emergency resources as it prepared for, for the pandemic um, for, in terms of people, equipment and supplies and facilities to respond to the emergency. Um, as the struggle in responding to these issues uh, emerged from multiple fronts and it deepened the already existing crisis in, in, on different matters, on, on public housing, on health um, and, and open spaces, um, the, it required and necessitated the community response, which came in the form of mutual aid and solidarity networks. Um, the service workers who keep our city running, care workers, home health aides, nurse aides, uh, nurse aides food service workers, warehouse staff, among others, had been at the front lines, uh, lines of the COVID-19 um, crisis, using the data released by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene a New York City-based NGO, Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, um, looked into the uh, COVID cases and made an analysis that they found the high rates of positive COVID-19 cases are concentrated in the neighborhoods where many of New York's frontline service workers live. These neighborhoods are disproportionately communities of color, and they correspond to both high rates of positive COVID-19 cases and high rent burden, meaning that they are spending 30% or more of their total income um, to rent, which is one of the one of the metrics that the SDG um, 11 is looking in. Um, so the housing has been a local, you know, long-standing issue in New York City um, in the form of affordable housing provision, loss of existing publicly funded uh, funded housing resources, and drastic rent increases in market rate housing, where renters fall behind rent due to losing their employment. Uneven distribution of public and open green spaces became more visible when people experienced difficulty in accessing such services in neighborhood where overcrowding is a common common experience. And we don't have um, similarly successful uh, policy measures, even though uh, there are a lot of efforts, um, we don't have yet uh, the gains that Berlin, for instance, had uh, in, on that front. 
Um, another issue had been that the homeless can't stay home and it's been being homelessness, people experiencing homelessness have been uh, largely stigmatized early on and it was um, they were disregarded in the preparation or the um, in initial response. The city was already experiencing record homelessness among single adults and near record homelessness among families when the pandemic began. Um, over the past year, an average of 60,000 New Yorkers stayed in New York City homeless shelter system each night. And this data is from public homeless services and doesn't include any private um, shelter data. Um, and most homeless sing single adults were sheltered in congregate settings with shared dorms, dining areas and bathrooms, along with continually rotating staff and conditions poorly suited to, uh, uh, to containing the spread uh, of the virus. And according to a recent report by Rate of Homeless, uh, single adults in New York City reached record levels during the pandemic, while the number of homeless families declined. And uh, this might be related to the uh, impact of short-term pandemic relief and um, eviction moratorium, which is now in place, uh, which is the result of advocacy efforts, which I will talk about uh, briefly in a moment. Um, but of course, uh, because they are short term, it might also mean that the numbers will continue to in increase as these uh, short term relief efforts um, um, are not in place anymore. Um, something happened to my slides. Okay, so COVID-19 has revealed the racial and economic inequity that has already been embedded in the city's socioeconomic infrastructure. This pandemic is not just only a public health crisis, but a crisis of racial and economic um, justice. Uh, er early on, uh, COVID-19 pandemic was dubbed as the equalizer um, of uh, that e e equalizes society. Um, but we also observed through the uh, to, um, data advocacy groups research higher and more severe COVID-19 cases all um, coming from um, particular neighborhoods um, that are um, uh, uh, people of color in, in general in New York City. And there had been uh, signs of a larger impending housing crisis. Ah, okay, my uh, slides are coming afterwards which are all results of um, you know, early on foundational uh, conditions that uh, presided this, uh, this pandemic. And so they became, some of them became, became more visible, some of them appeared in a more, more drastic way. Um, so looking into the disproportionately crowded households that are already rent burdened. Um, and also they have uh, been experiencing um, air and land pollution, which led to respiratory diseases that um, aggravated the, the impact of COVID-19 um, uh, 19 crisis. So we are looking into um, the, the crisis is not just a momentary thing, but uh, accumulation of um, disinvestment and um, all the uh, wrongful practices from, uh, from before, as well as we uh, see the, the COVID pandemic un unfolding. So it's not been an equalizer. It has been all more in uh, visibilizing what has been unequal um, all along. New York City is by far the most populous city in the United States and also has a very high share of renters. Uh, according to 2017 New York City Housing and Vacancy Survey, New York City's population is approximately 8.4 million people living in uh, 3.1 million households. And a little over two thirds of New York City households rent their units, uh, while just under a third of households own their units. Um, and the New Yorkers' experiences on housing conditions differ based on various demographic characteristics. I'll just uh, put in some of the um, uh, data just to kind of give a better understanding on how, how um, it has been uh, experienced by different groups. So black and Hispanic New Yorkers are overrepresented in rental units with maintenance issues, meaning that they have been um, experiencing lack of maintenance and care, and, and, they have, um, and this has been a part of their uh, rental experience, um, um, this kind of maintenance deficiencies. Um, renter households with children are most likely to live in units with maintenance issues out of all uh, household types, and lower income renters that pay a majority of their income toward rent are particularly vulnerable to housing instability. So one of the metrics that SDG 11 is looking is the is the rent burden, and we're looking into severely rent burden 
communities that are predominantly um, Black and Hispanic in New York City. Um, so even though uh, as we look in the metrics in the U.S. performance, um, there are challenges in reaching, but we look into more detail that we see that um, the, fare of, um, the, the share of the burden is disproportionately distributed to different, different parts, which would require different, of course, um, intervention methods. Um, so the, the combination of severe rent burden, lost wages, and little to no emergency savings um, is also likely to result in large-scale housing instability, which kind of brings us to the to, to, uh, um, uh, homelessness uh, issues. And what we have been um, also seeing um, in, as a part of the ex pandemic experience, we saw a drastic change in the way uh, how we move um, in the city and also intercity, but I just want to focus on the changing mobilities. Um, New York City public transportation infrastructure, which is another metric that, that you, you can look um, and um, US is underperforming, um, has been long uh, due for uh, maintenance uh, investment. Um, and we have seen that the use has drastically dropped and people have been more looking into their locality, um, looking into reaching um, open green spaces, um, and they've been uh, utilizing their, their um, uh, neighborhoods um, much more. Uh, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, New York City was facing a profound hunger crisis. More than 2.5 million working age New Yorkers were struggling to make ends meet, um, meaning that they are worried about their next meal or worried about the end of um, pay month uh, or pay week um, to, um, for running out of food. Um, so it, it, this, it was about nearly 1.2 million New Yorkers experiencing this food insecurity, including one in five New York City children. One of the reasons why New York City could not go into lockdown as quick as it should, um, despite the numbers, has been that um, um, uh, a lot of children uh, or children receive uh, for free uh, food services from public school system. And, um, and there was a logistic issue on how to, how to uh, uh, provide this service without public schools being, being open. So a little bit of the, of the efforts that we have. And I, I forgot to run my timer, so I don't know how I'm doing in time. Uh, hopefully it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not too bad. Okay, you are doing okay. Okay. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about like, you know, what is happening and this driven through um, uh, more uh, community driven efforts. And one of them is uh, responding to um, community uh, affordable housing crisis, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are far behind in how uh, Berlin has been responding both on the policy and regulations level, uh, but uh, community land trust um, uh, as a model, uh, a collective ownership has been around since 1960s, but since 2005 and 2020, the community land trust in the uh, country grew uh, drastically and New York State uh, have been um, approaching it as a more collective uh, effort and in the last two years have uh, launched a few community land trust initiatives and ways to support, uh, support groups who uh, would like to uh, provide this as an option, as the current affordable housing um, offerings are not um, uh, enough for the for the uh, scale of the crisis that we are we are going through. Um, I have mentioned earlier that the the gap that was the in city's response to um, to uh, COVID nineteen crisis had been filled by community organizations, solidarity networks, and mutual aid groups. Um, so most of the community-based organizations, regardless of what their approach or work uh, is for, they immediately set up uh, to respond to food, medical gear help, and providing support for emergency help, in, including like housing counseling. Um, mutual aid um, involved people getting food and medicine, really a, a basic role, but is it sustainable? It is all uh, voluntary driven efforts, and it's not been um, that much uh, uh, connected to it, but uh, in the way that the activism um, networks work, um, it also generates other um, 
uh, side benefit, let's say, because it's not a means and end, um, but it creates these networks, which is um, maybe the foundation of organizing and thinking about um, a collective uh, response to, um, to future crisis and our um, everyday life. So the looking into the uh, the housing crisis, there's a lot of I want to bring us to the to the metric question because most of these uh, SDG metrics are looking into data, but the data is uh, taken in a particular form, and it's as we know it is um, it, it has its own biases embedded in, and it actually not allows us to think of a clear picture on what is happening on the side. So. Um, there are very active um, groups that are looking into um, into data and, and community-driven data, um, uh, the, the, uh, particularly looking into evictions and how this is anti-eviction mapping project and their um, uh, tracking on the housing uh, protection and uh, legislation and looking into uh, that is, uh, data that is crowdsourced by by tenant organizers. And there has been a lot of um, efforts that started from uh, the community-based um, activism going into, um, this is an image from Right to Council as win in Albany in New York State um, on uh, both extending the eviction of moratorium until the end of 2022. Um, and uh, a significant pressure uh, from all grassroots and nonprofit organization um, to our local and federal government to take a step to mitigate uh, the pandemic's impact on housing, which we will experience in the coming years um, very broadly. Um, similar to Seren's example, Open Streets has been another thing that we've been um, uh, practicing. Um, it is not a new um, practice, but it's gained traction during the pandemic because of the way that some neighborhoods um, didn't have any place to physically distance and the households had been um, overcrowded. Uh, but when we look at the final application, um, the uh, only 37% of New Yorkers live within walking distance of an open street. Um, and it has been uh, looking at the demographics, the ones that needed mostly because they, they lacked an earlier accessibility for such a, a you know, park or open green area, um, they didn't uh, benefit from the open streets project. So location really mattered in this and um, um, advocacy organizations like Transportation Alternatives have been um, bringing this up um, uh, and which led to New York City reconsidering the new um, designations of open streets um, based on the demo uh, more equitable based um, distribution in terms of demographics. But there's um, more to go because it's um, this is also another service that relies on the community relationships and, and how it's uh, driven and how it is managed. Um, currently, the open streets are managed by NYPD, uh, which has, uh, of course, uh, creating a lot of uh, implications in terms of policing. In, in certain certain areas. Uh, food Forward NYC is the city's first ever 10 year food policy plan. This kind of launched during the pandemic and uh, it is looking into um, the importance of equity and choice and uh, maybe bringing us to thinking of the local production and local in the, in the sense of that uh, well, we understood the, the crisis in supply chains and logistics that uh, impacted the uh, impacted globally. Um, food, food Forward MIC is looking into uh, both providing um, healthy and affordable and culturally appropriate food um, in, in accessible uh, uh, prices. I'm not going to go into uh, detail on how it unfolds, but as, as a goodwill from the local government, I think it um, uh, kind of shows uh, an intention to address the ongoing uh, food crisis, which is uh, now, um, you know, the, the mutual aid groups are still working, like community fridges, um, as it was in the earlier, earlier picture that has been um, used. So just to kind of bring in, in I just want to um, maybe finalize it with the, with the conversation that Seren also uh, talk about the paradigm shifts. We need it, we need it urgently. We need to think about 
rethink about how we look into sustainability and resilience, maybe ask our questions, can we standardize a sustainable city? There are a lot of um, these um, uh, uh, ways um, to look into the data that we have, uh, the um, planning and design uh, tools that we are um, we are using that needs to be rethought. Um, thinking, rethinking sustainability and resilience from the point of fair share of benefits and burdens, um, and from not just human perspective, but from multi-species perspective, and thinking of having a more systemic approach um, in how we uh, look into this um, this data. Uh, we talk about um, collaboration. Maybe we are we should be more talking about equitable engagement, um, which requires uh, infrastructures uh, to provide that inclusion. Smart cities, for instance, uh, which uh, kind of uh, gained uh, traction in the past years, assumes assumes some sort of digital citizenship, uh, which doesn't really take into consideration the digital equity aspect of it, where people's access to data um, um, in a free way is limited in the communities that tend to be underrepresented in those conversations. So we are leaving more uh, people behind. Um, local governments supporting what communities are already doing have more chance in successful uh, implementation of the work. So meeting communities where they are and meeting um, in terms of the needs and also the efforts because they are doing the work um, in the in the um, points where uh, communities, uh, where the local governments are, are lacking. And lastly, the grassroots data collection system. I think we need to think about uh, citizen generated data, think about the transparency, both the gathering of the data, um, but also at the same time, transparency and dissemination of the data where the communities can actually uh, have a broader look to, to um, uh, themselves and um, that they can also utilize um, this data that is um, collected on behalf of them. And I think I will just stop there um, so that we can have uh, some more conversation on, um, on how we each approached to this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Evran. Uh, if you can please uh, unshare your screen, then we have a more cozy environment to uh, discuss. Um, I would like to thank you all for this, uh, these very interesting presentations, which make me think about uh, several important topics that uh, are waiting for us to deal with, I think, as academics. Um, uh, I think if I would summarize what we had uh, as, uh, from different perspectives, of course, um, from your presentations, uh, Serin was uh, focusing on uh, social innovative change through bottom-up initiatives, uh, focusing on uh, really constructive approaches uh, from Romania. And I think it was also very interesting to have this very international perspective, Berlin and uh, New York and uh, different initiatives from Romania gave us very different um, you know, uh, practices, but also different feelings about what kind of crisis we are actually dealing with. Uh, the more focused on uh, deepening housing crisis uh, in relation to modes of uh, collaboration. And uh, Evren also focused on affordable housing crisis in relation to the uh, corona crisis. And I really like there these multiplying effects of the crisis. The crises are not just health crises. These crises actually nuanced the underlying uh, problems that we already had or inequalities that we already have in the society. So we had this rather dark picture, uh, if you like. Um, and then this hanging concept around a uh, new urban agenda, which uh, makes me also think whether our uh, issue is to define a new urban agenda or um, define a way to a kind of uh, institutional way or governance approach to deal with this form of uh, crisis. Um, these presentations, although uh, they uh, had very different uh, backgrounds, of course, my field is urban governance, 
And I like to think from the governance perspective, how we can get all these uh, you know, fragmented, uh, bottom-up uh, diversity of variegated approaches and establish something on the basis of that for the future. And uh, that also made me think of um, the concept uh, of meta-governance uh, of Bob Jesup, um, who said that uh, the governance of a specific space will involve complex social spatial configurations and this hugely multiplies the complexities of governance. And I think this is what is happening at the moment, these multiplying effects with multiple actors and multiple crises getting together uh, there. Uh, which also means, again, uh, with uh, Bob Jacobs' uh, terms, uh, a requirement for governance of a governance. Uh, so we need a meta-governance to basically nuance those uh, transformative um, practices that you have been presenting to us uh, very nicely. So I think I would like to start with a general question within this framework. Um, there are all these uh, institutional efforts, you have been touching them, and there are all these bottom-up efforts. What is the best approach to create this learning uh, environment where we can replicate good practices, but not in just uh, small, uh, let's say, uh, areas, but in, in bigger scales of cities? How do we get learning uh, institutionalized in this environment? Maybe I would like to start with this question. And because, Gözde, you were specifically talking about learning, maybe we should start with you as a reflection, and then we will pick from there. Yeah, to know, John, thank you very much for the question. Um, how do we get learning institutionalized? Um, yeah, I think that's, that's quite an interesting uh, uh, question, and also that with this housing project that I was um, Presenting today, House of uh, Statistics, um, within the project, the learning and um, of uh, working together, the very uh, learning of uh, collaborating, the learning of uh, participating continues. Uh, but also, there are those um, uh, within this project. There are all these in between mechanisms, formats, um, and strategies, and feedback mechanisms. Uh, and that is actually collecting um, this kind of uh, um, uh, knowledge and, and uh, uh, try to uh, uh, make uh, use of it in terms of turning this into um, certain um, governing or a certain institutional um, um, fo uh, form. But I think what is really um, in this example uh, uh, something to be uh, uh, maybe cautious or, or or something to be uh, yeah, and aware of is that from the beginning, um, it's a project that is uh, being formed uh, by the uh, institutions who have the decision-making, uh, uh, very involved in the decision-making processes. And so them, themselves, um, since they're in the beginning, are actors involved in that, there is, um, there is no delay in kind of uh, um, translating uh, this uh, learnings uh, from one um, situation to another. So maybe um, this involvement um, of uh, those actors from the beginning um, um, during the process is something to be, um, um, be cautious and um, maybe maintain um, um, off. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I, th I think it's a very good point uh, you are touching. And I think also, the uh, of course, learning, uh, we learn, right? We learn, uh, we learn our lessons, but do they stay long with us? That's, I think, also another uh, question that we have to, you know, uh, uh, keep in mind because kind of institutional memories of uh, organizations are very short term or they disappear in time. Uh, so all these good practices that we have been recording, um, they somehow vanish when they are not becoming part of a systemic institutional body. 
But of course, the big question here is, if we have such a very established institutional body, whether that will enable further bottom-up initiatives and creativity, whether it will kill it, because the opponents of the institutionalization also claim that. So um, what are thoughts on that? Maybe, Evran, shall I uh, give you the floor? Yeah, of course. I, I don't know if I can answer. I will, maybe I will ask more questions in there. I mean, I'm just thinking of... Um, uh, because the way that um, the, the work happens, again, talking from the New York City perspective, is that there are these intermediary organizations that um, have that connection um, um, with the community, direct connection with their constituents, and as well that they are um, looking into uh, governmental bodies in terms of how they can have their impact. I think the work uh, from that um, intersection um, is really powerful and something that uh, we should tap into uh, into more as institutions. Um, it could be uh, the practices I'm just thinking of um, uh, giving the power of um, decision making, delegating the power of decision making, and um, and spending. Um, the the city like New York has has a. Um, a really big budget that um, it, it delegates a part of it through, for instance, participatory budgeting um, practices where uh, communities can um, directly influence what it will be spent on. So we need to think of, um, I think, ways in which to delegate power um, in a way and opening it up and making those processes more transparent, but also being mindful of, um, you know, how do we design the the participation practices as a part of it. Like how do people uh, really bring in, because part is, uh, as it is right now, you know, uh, maybe which pandemic might have brought some equity in, um, participating, you know, weekly, monthly meetings um, is a privilege for those who have the time and, and the economics to, to afford that. Uh, we usually assume that it is something and we end up with the, with the same group of people who already hold uh, power and decision making, you know, um, initiatives on themselves, attending and uh, giving. So they're overrepresented, but we don't really hear from people who really need these services and how do we reach out to them. So it is um, both the institutional memory of things, how to delegate um, the, the, the power um, in a way that it really reaches the, the groups that um, that really require. Intermediary organizations might be, because they're already working with the ground up um, with those communities, and they have a better view of, of what is happening. And, and at the end of my presentation, I mentioned about the crowdsourced data and using your data. Um, I think those practices really matter. New York City has open data um, uh, practice, which you can download and access, but um, to make them understandable, to the larger audiences um, really fall into, for instance, data advocacy groups um, that have been uh, working working on these um, efforts. So it's not really an answer, but there are a few things that practices that we need to we need to think about, I think, on this matter. I, I, I fully agree with you. And also, I'm very glad you uh, bring up this data uh, and knowledge perspective into the discussion. Uh, because that's what I also notice in, in the city of Amsterdam. Uh, there is a very interesting knowledge platform established by the city of Amsterdam to put together um, all kinds of research activities, data, publications, uh, whatever going on in the practice or in the academia or elsewhere on a digital platform, on uh, basically physical locations in the city which of course empowers not only the politicians but uh, or practitioners or academics but also citizens to have, have access to what are the possibilities and also to have a better overview on their own city uh, we have been discussing i think you all refer to the similar kind of right to the city uh, kind of movements it's very nice to say people should claim right to the city but how do you write, claim your right to the city if you don't know anything about your city? Uh, you will only claim your right for your own uh, good otherwise. And that's 
uh, of course, one of the challenges of this kind of bottom-up practices, I think, um, being very, you know, selfishly oriented towards their own targets rather than larger public targets. Which brings me to Serin, and maybe Serin can uh, also give us some reflections on that, uh, because uh, I think um, in Romania you presented this very constructive, positive uh, environment. How is the institutional infrastructure that accommodated it? How is the atmosphere, political atmosphere that dealt with it um, in that respect? Yes, um, I especially extracted those lessons because uh, we actually lack a lot of institutionalization on this uh, matter. So when we think of public participation, it's just normally informing people about uh, the projects or plans in a framework of 30 days in which they can, you know, contribute with some am amendments that sometimes never happen. Uh, we are still learning and fortunately as a response and the thing that you were saying also that in uh, response or in spite of this lack of institutionalization, uh, bottom-up initiatives become much more driven and creative in bringing forward their true needs and, you know, showing the way of, um, of what they want to see from the city. So uh, this was actually the, the point, the point that I wanted to make and I believe that when you said, uh, if we are losing creativity, for example, if uh, the state will come and meet us, uh, not meet us halfway, but maybe intrude. Because when I'm thinking of um, institutionalized participation, I'm thinking of uh, neighborhood planning from London, or maybe urban management, I mean, uh, neighborhood management uh, from Berlin. And somehow when I was there and analyzing this kind of initiatives, it felt a bit of intrusive in a way. I don't know what Gerti would uh, would feel about this. So uh, that brings me back to uh, Evren's point in between the power and interest. So whose power about what and whose interest about what? So we have to somehow find a balance between these two for the ones that are in need and for the ones that can enable these actions. And um, we we have a good, I mean, we have several other good examples, but as everyone pointed out about the participatory budgeting, um, it is working quite nicely in a municipality here, Cluj, it was also in my presentation, but it has a long-standing, um, you know, uh, political, uh, I mean, the same political party is for several of years there. So this political party dependency maybe is another issue that we should talk about uh, when we talk about this kind of kind of meeting top down and bottom up. It is a fortunate case because they want public participation. So then they're enforcing this kind of uh, practices. Uh, but it's quite one of the fewest examples in our country. Yeah, I think I think these are uh, for now. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, of course, I mean, politics uh, in that respect is uh, very uh, a very important uh, aspect of planning. I think we should not forget that there are all these political intentions in the background of the practice and that that will define, uh, of course, the effectivity of uh, our actions. Um, I think the next point that I would like to bring uh, on the table is also connected to learning a bit is uh, establishing interlinkages between different initiatives. Uh, because of course, uh, you can see the landscape of the city or governance landscape of the city, especially after the crisis, uh, completely uh, affected by, uh, yeah, di or distracted by the crisis, let's say, uh, discontinuity of efforts and new efforts are coming and uh, almost like mushrooming everywhere in the city while everywhere almost we see underlying housing crisis, affordability crisis or accessibility crisis to urban living. Um, so how do we accept, uh, I think we discussed data, I think data and knowledge is a very important element to establish interlinkages for a transformative governance structure in the city. 
what else could you imagine um, as a important characteristics to establish these interlinkages in cities that you are dealing with? Um, maybe we start with Evran this time. It's a, it's a very tough question. I can I can take a stab and then we can see we can see how it goes. I I just want I had a connecting thought in in relation to data because without being informed on how um, a certain change will impact you, it's really hard for making a decision. So if being informed uh, in there and, and something that uh, we are thinking about. Um, at my school um, as well, is that how do we disseminate the information that we are generating um, on, on work, the way, the way we work as academics. Um, and also it is uh, something to do with local governments as well, that we gather this data, but it's never accessible in the form and format um, that it will be beneficial for those. So there are some practices that we need to be also thinking about um, uh, you know, we we create, um, you know, gather all these uh, creative, brilliant brains together and tinker on these issues and generate some propositions, not necessarily solutions, but you know, um, addressing some of the ongoing issues. But we, in a way, sit on it um, on, on on academia. Uh, similar to um, you know, like how do we connect? There's definitely that kind of a linkage in knowledge sharing. And knowledge sharing, thinking of maybe valuing in the same way um, a, a non-academic format so of uh, disseminating um, that information um, is, is the foundation, foundation on here. Um, and another one is that, um, you know, uh, thinking through some of the uh, infrastructure for uh, actually making these connections are already there. We just, they either malfunction um, or um, not working in the intended way. Uh, just to give an example, um, that New York City is um, also separated uh, with community boards, which kind of aims to um, get community-based representation uh, from uh, 46 different different districts. And so it is a model um, that is based on, um, you know, uh, informing and also gathering uh, feedback on, on the upcoming you know, planning proposals, certain investments in, in neighborhoods and so on. So the system is there, um, but as it requires the, uh, the way of uh, you know, very labor intensive contribution, and the people who are there are sometimes you know, real estate developers uh, that are taking part of these. You know, so the, the system is there, but it doesn't function in the same way as soliciting um, that. So maybe rethinking the already existing infrastructure that we have built up for this. Um, and um, I just want to bring in back about the participation models. How do we think? And time is a, time is a big issue in here um, because maybe for those who will be the most impacted, for them to understand the impact better, um, maybe we need to kind of rethink of how we look into, you know, um, practices like zoning, rezoning, and changing uh, or making these decisions that will have long-term impact um, uh, that requires a little bit longer time um, and more open process uh, early on, uh, so that only the ones who are already informed or has a you know financial stake, larger financial stake, kind of gets in and uh, contributes to the decision. Yes, I think uh, very good. Uh, I think a uh, couple of very good points you made there, Evran, and one of them is definitely the role of planning here. I I am excited about this because I think uh, in this we will get a bit more. We should get a little bit more attention on planning instruments and knowledge uh, in uh, planning. I think secondly also commoning. Uh, data and data resources is very important. Data uh, has become a kind of privilege in the hands of, uh, you know, property investors, whoever can afford, afford uh, buying big data sets, but uh, commoning available uh, open access data, really making it open access, uh, but with certain uh, categorizations, topics that are relevant to the society, would make it interesting for people to, or uh, enable people to uh, take part in, uh, in processes. 
Uh, there is a specific question about data, Evren, to you uh, from the audience, but I will get back to it uh, afterwards. I would like to turn to Gözde. Maybe uh, you can tell us your thoughts about interlinkages. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking of when um, um, Evren was mentioning about the collective responses uh, to the crisis. Um, uh, she also mentioned about the, the side benefits that those uh, kind of initiatives are, are creating. And this is um, so much that uh, regenerating those uh, networks, maintaining so, uh, those networks and those actors are uh, kind of uh, linked with each other um, somehow um, so that um, for the collective memory and of the city and this remains in the city and this shapes of also the uh, kind of uh, political ima imaginary uh, of what the future might hold and so in berlin i'm i'm thinking of this example of the temple of um, airport uh, referendum took place in 2014 uh, and the city uh, wanted to kind of redevelop the area and put some housing um, uh, estates um, there and um, um, yeah, partially transform it uh, to a developed area and um, the citizens uh, wanted it to remain um, as it is. Um, and this initiative um, who was behind it, 100% Temple of, um, uh, I think that was the name of the initiative, later transformed um, partially into this initiative um, uh, that um, made uh, um, or that is one part of actually um, the initiative behind um, the House of the Statistics project currently. So this um, uh, kind of referendum and the initiative that uh, generated it uh, transferred the knowledge and the infrastructural um, uh, capacity uh, to another initiative uh, uh, to maintain another vacant uh, spot and uh, uh, turn it into or bring it into into use. I think this is very much uh, uh, of one of the, the side benefits of uh, having um, uh, uh, this kind of um, happenings um, in the city. And um, how could this be rescaled? Um, I uh, don't know, of course, and this is, uh, yeah, um, um, this would be an intriguing question, and I don't think that um, yeah, there is only one answer because they're so situated and, and they're also very temporarily embedded um, into um, into the context. Yeah, I think yeah. Perhaps uh, for new research, these are very valid and interesting questions because I I, I think that we will have to rethink the scales of planning and uh, spatial interventions uh, when we are thinking of the future. I mean, we can't anymore just think of a, a specific location without considering this wider context. It's a clear message that uh, I think we receive after the corona crisis. Uh, Serin, last but not least, uh, what are your thoughts on these interlinkages? Yeah, um, complementing what uh, Gözde and Evren said, there's, uh, and also referring a bit to the theoretical framework, how you, how you underlined, I'm, I mean, coming from the right to the city and following on that uh, line and uh, arriving to urban planning, actually urban design and so on, and uh, connecting it also with the data visualization of Evren, I'm thinking of the spatial justice concept and the fact that we now see it's more and more urgent to uh, show and also make, uh, I mean, it's not only about showing the data and making it as an uh, open access, open source uh, um, kind of thing, but uh, also translating it into the language of the citizens, translating it into the, into the language of the ones that uh, should engage in um, in the further processes, uh, collaborative processes, and I uh, totally agree with the um, with the learning process that also bottom up initiatives go through. So it's not just in, uh, because we talked about institutions and how they uh, have the short memory. Um, bottom up initiatives they also are interest. I mean interest, but okay, driven by their need, or you know. Um, whatever that is, if it's eviction, if it's uh, public space, if it's food security, et cetera. And uh, I think we should make a system in which they can learn from each other and they can maintain the same 
needs because sometimes uh, it's a community in a neighborhood. For example, we had a cinema place that was, you know, uh, trying to be transformed in a mall or something, and the community fought for it. And let's say it uh, became a success, and they uh, regained, you know, that cultural space. But maybe in another neighborhood or in another city in Romania happened the same and uh, the ones there couldn't have access to these learnings here and what were the procedures and so on. So I think um, there should be linkages also in between these kind of initiatives and maybe academia, because you also said about academia, it's, I mean, I really want to, because we are all from university here, I really want to bring it back to school. Um, yeah, I think uh, we should uh, raise more planners that know uh, they have different roles and they have to practice advocacy planning because they have to not only design but also mediate but also engage but also you know just do whatever we need to have a better world until 2030 or yeah. whatever <laughs> yeah yes. Thank you, Serin. That's a very nice uh, uh, end message. I think the role of planners here. And before we wrap up, we have still a couple of minutes. Uh, I would like to also, um, I think, uh, collectively think about the role of the state here, because uh, I think we have to roll of, uh, rethink the role of the state uh, in this process. Uh, of course, it sounds a little bit strange when you think about creativity, bottom-up initiatives, and so on. But my experience is that without funding and without having certainty, these initiatives um, uh, don't have very long-term effects. Um, not only those initiatives, but uh, nowadays planning uh, interventions don't have very long effects. Uh, we have been talking about and discussing the neoliberal entrepreneurial uh, environment in which the cities are developing. And I think COVID added a new uh, layer to this. And especially coming back to this session's main topic, sustainability agenda, I think we really have to rethink these big terms like sustainability, what it means for us, what it means for cities, I mean, and the role of the states to maybe uh, ensure a bit more intervention, certainty, funding, and yeah, uh, perhaps re-questioning the, uh, the directions that we have been taking in, in cities, especially in relation to markets, citizens, and states, how those relations are reformulated by neoliberal uh, initiatives or political economic ideology, and how we should maybe have a new direction in there, uh, independent from uh, the old dynamics that we have been discussing. So it's a bit of a provocating uh, thought. Uh, maybe we need more state intervention in the coming years in order to ensure the creativity and uh, bottom-up success of the citizens. Before I close the session, I would like to ask, because there's one question specifically asked for Evran. Uh, uh, it's about top, um, collecting and uh, processing data. Uh, mm -hmm. You are referring to, I'm translating from Turkish, you were referring to uh, this at the end of your presentation. What kind of data you were talking about? Uh, can you please elaborate on that a little bit? Okay. Uh, in the last one minute, 30 seconds, uh, very, very quickly. Um, the data I'm referring to just to give an example, so maybe it might be illustrated better, um, the organization that I showed the slide map from um, Association of Neighborhood Development, for instance, uh, pulls the data from New York City on um, tenant complaints on uh, landlords, for instance, about maintenance issues. It collects data from um, rent-related tax uh, information and it identifies the, the buildings um, that are under stress for potential eviction. Um, this kind of data and overlapping um, a set of data 
helps the tenant organizers to uh, prioritize their efforts. Uh, so the data is available, but the advocacy organization kind of overlaps. I don't know. This is the fastest answer Thank you. <laughs> that I can so give. Thank you very much, Evran. That was brilliant. Uh, I would like to thank you all. Uh, it was a fantastic session. I really learned a lot, and I hope that our audience also uh, enjoyed the discussion as much as we did uh, among each other. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you Thank all. Thank you so much. And to know Jim also for moderating. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs>